Hi everyone, and welcome back to F110 Autonomous Racing. Um, in today's lecture, we are going to switch to a new topic in this course uh, called simultaneous localization as map and mapping, as you can see on the uh, on the slide and this little animation showing uh, how this map is getting built as the simulated uh, F110 car goes around a virtual track. Uh, and the main sort of theme of this new topic is very different from uh, what we've covered previously, which was uh, focusing on reactive methods towards autonomy, where you are only relying on uh, you know, your current sensor information to make a decision on how to steer and how to speed up. Uh, whereas uh, an alternate sort of uh, way of doing autonomy and the most prevalent way is actually utilizing mapping information of the environment around you. And so we are going to talk about what is SLAM and how it works. So before I jump into the uh, details of uh, the topics we'll cover, let's actually take a look at what the end result is going to look like, right? So here you see a video of the uh, F110 car. It's been actually driven manually on the top left uh, um, dashboard sort of onboard camera. It's been driven manually around this uh, very wide corridor. And on the right hand side, you can see a synchronized RVIS view of uh, a map getting built as more and more of the corridor is discovered uh, with the onboard uh, LIDAR. Right, so it's a 2D scanning LiDAR and you can actually even see that in the map itself, we are not just building and exploring the map. We are in fact also keeping track of what we think the robot's path is in the environment with this green line. Right, so, so this is where this term of simultaneousness comes from. We are both mapping and localizing the car in the map we are building uh, simultaneously and that's why it's called SLAM. And so the, the idea uh, in today's lecture is by the end of the lecture today, let me also quickly switch, switch to the pointer. Uh, by the end of today's lecture, uh, you'll know what SLAM is. Uh, we will talk about some very um, prevalent implementations of SLAM. In particular, we will talk about building occupancy maps as the primitive sort of basic building block of mapping. Uh, I'm going to talk and tie this back to scan matching, which we've spent a lot of time talking about and actually even uh, showing you a demos of that previously. And finally, time permitting, uh, we'll uh, go into details of how SLAM is implemented in ROS. Uh, and I'll also walk you through uh, one of very popular and recent uh, algorithm for SLAM called the Google Cartographer algorithm. So why don't we just dive right into this? So the idea of you know, what SLAM is, uh, you can literally break it down into the two sort of main components, localization and mapping. So as we have seen actually previously, that localization is the problem that if you are given the, the map of the environment, uh, you will want to localize our robot or the F110 car on where it is in the environment, right? This is very important for a race car. We need to know where you know, it's in a straight or near the turn. Uh, and so, so, so here the problem is we are given the map, which we will learn how to build as well. And you are, uh, you're supposed to figure out where you are in the map uh, and all of the previous, you know, post transformations and the ROS transformation and coordinate frame applies to this problem as well. And the mapping problem is sort of the dual or, you know, the, the complementary problem where you know how you are moving and can you accumulate this information to build a map of your surroundings, right? So you are given, the, in this case, the pose of the F110 car or the robot at every step. Uh, you can also think of the pose or a sequence of poses as what is called a trajectory. And what you want to do is build, um, you know, using the sensor information at every pose, you want to combine them and aggregate all that information uh, into a map or some sort of a map that you can later utilize. Um, so you can see how to build the map, you need localization information and uh, to do localize, you need a map. And so that's why um, simultaneous localization and mapping, which is this problem three, is that can we use the sensor data at every time step and the pose information at every time step to estimate both the trajectory of the robot and build the map as the robot is exploring some environment. So as you can imagine, it's a not an easy problem to solve, but um, I, my claim is that the understanding the mapping component is, is crucial, and then the localization component is going to be very similar to what we've seen before. In fact, we'll have a separate lecture uh, on different methods of localizing, for example, using a Kalman filter or a particle filter. 
So a brief history of SLAM uh, is presented just to cover the basic ground of where we are coming from. Um, I think why do we need, a, need why do we even need a map is a pretty straightforward question because having access to a map, you can do predictive or you know um, long term path planning, which you cannot do in a reactive algorithm such as wall following, which you are implementing for uh, sort of this week's uh, uh, assignment exercise. Um, in addition, you know, it has been shown, uh, the jury is still out there, but for more, for complicated environments, for very like cluttered environments, which have a lot of features that you can latch onto, you can actually localize better if you have mapping information. That also uh, is one of the reasons why we need to build a map, not just for planning, but also for the low level localization uh, as well. Um, and then uh, as far as the localization part of it is concerned, it has also evolved over uh, several decades. Um, like I said, Kalman filter, which is what EKF, extended Kalman filter stands for. Uh, we will go over that in the in a subsequent lecture, but um, they have evolved to more sort of efficient, uh, widely used particle filters, which can exploit GPU capabilities on the embedded computers. And we'll cover uh, these methods as well. Um, and so there's been a lot of development from building very basic primitive maps to uh, building 3D maps with 3D LIDARs. Most of our discussion is going to be limited to the uh, 2D laser scan type LIDAR as is present on the uh, F110 autonomous vehicle. So, you know, the limitation of not using a map uh, is sort of uh, cartoonishly being shown here that you, uh, in the absence of a detailed map, you can use what is called you know, basic, you know, route guidance where you are keeping track of, or you have a lookup table that tells you that the first turn that you encounter is a right-hand turn, the second turn is a right-hand turn, the third and the fourth is maybe a left-hand turn and things like that. So it's uh, literally, uh, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is actually being used in one of the original DARPA challenges. They provided a root definition file, which was literally a sequences of what turns uh, at what distances does the vehicle have to make. And so this is a form of a very high level and basic path planning for anything more nuanced than this, such as is required for uh, autonomous car, you may have to actually plan how the race line will look like when you encounter a 90 degree right hand turn as is shown here, right? So the behavior of the race car will depend upon how you approach this right hand turn. When do you brake? When do you accelerate and you hit the apex? Uh, and once again, we'll have a dedicated lecture, maybe at the very tail end of this course about racing strategies and thinking about race lines and how to apply uh, all of the low level mapping and localization and uh, path planning in the racing context. So here is maybe, you know, where we can start. So this is typically what you see in robotics when someone presents a two dimensional map of the environment. So here, this looks like this is a map of some indoor corridor. Uh, and you can see the legend here clearly shows that everything which is completely blacked out is considered to be like free space or drivable space. Um, and anything which is fully bright or white uh, is a boundary or an obstacle or an edge that has been detected by this laser scanner. And everything else which is in gray is sort of unexplored area or we don't know uh, you know, what is the status of uh, obstacles or free space in that area. And so this is what, what we have been also looking at and I've shown you similar pictures many, many times in the course. Today, I'm actually going to explain how to interpret this and how to even build this using um, ideas like scan matching and um, basics, you know, odometry and uh, base sensor fusion as well. So to, to get us started, we will first cover the idea of what is an occupancy grid map. Occupancy grids are very widely used in mapping algorithms, including all or most of SLAM algorithms. There are other techniques to represent maps as well, uh, but occupancy grid map for the most part is very, very popular and uh, it's worth spending time in learning what that is. And so the idea of a occupancy grid map is actually quite simple. Um, Occupancy itself can be thought of as a random variable. Okay, so this is a binary random variable. Uh, we can say occupancy M given by some 2D coordinate X, Y is a binary random variable which can take, <coughs> excuse me, which can take two values. It can take a value free uh, or occupied. And we map these values into some real space where we represent free occupancy as zero 
uh, and occupied by one, right? So it, it fulfills all the definitions of what is a random variable. In this case, occupancy can be thought of by, as a random uh, binary variable um, notated and then, uh, the, the notation for that is going to be the small m. So what is a grid map? A grid map is just this array or a matrix or a sequence of cells where each cell has its occupancy denoted by this random variable, right? So you can think of this uh, 2D uh, grid map, which is shown here, where the occupancy variable is associated with every cell of this map, and it will have a different value, uh, either of free or of occupied. So, so far so good, nothing really, you know, that uh, shocking or complex. The idea of occupancy grid mapping is the following, and maybe this is the part which may, uh, you know, kind of uh, will deviate a little bit from intuition. So we have this 2D grid where every cell has some occupancy status, but we want to think of the occupancy of the cell because it is a random variable. Um, we want to assign a probability with every cell in this grid being occupied or not occupied, okay? So, so every cell of the grid is gonna be assigned some probability that what does the robot think? Is there an obstacle in this cell in the world or on the grid or, or this grid is a free cell? And so this is the reason why we need to update the status of each of the cells as the robot moves around in the environment or in this grid. And to do so, we use Bayes rule, or you know, it's another name for Bayesian filtering, where what we do is we look at the prior, or you know, we recursively update the status of the probability of the occupancy for each cell, or we update the value of this random variable uh, for each cell. And to do so, we need to apply Bayes rule, as you will shortly see. But to apply based rule, it's not enough to, you know, start somewhere and we need a method, we need some information from the world that will tell us how these probabilities should look like or which cells should be occupied versus which cells should be free. And that information comes in form of the measurement from your robot or from your F110 car, right? So um, most occupancy grid mapping, they rely on the presence of a range sensor to tell us where uh, you know is the obstacle located in the frame of reference of the robot? So what you what you see here is the example of like a lidar range sensor, uh, where we have uh, a robot and it has a, a, I'm, I'm just showing a single ray of the lidar or the range sensor over here, and it, it's basically telling me that this particular ray um, detected some uh, um, or returned some measurement. Um, from this particular cell. And so if we denote the measurements by uh, small z, uh, measurements can tell us which cells are free and which cells are occupied, right? So the yellow cell is where we uh, got a return from our LIDAR uh, with a certain distance reported. And so we can calculate you know, which cell, which is this particular distance away, uh, is likely to be occupied uh, and all those cells which are leading us to that obstacle or to the occupied cell are going to be free. Otherwise, we would have had a return much earlier. Okay, so this is the measurement part. And uh, now you can think of, you know, since the measurement can be either reported as free or occupied, and you can think of the model or the measurement model as being the likelihood of observing a certain measurement given what we know about the cells, okay? So uh, it may have been a while since you have looked at probability. So this is the probability of observing a certain Z, which can take either zero or one as a value, conditioned upon what we know about the value of M for this occupancy grid. So in other words, since this is a very simple example, we already know that M, which is the uh, occupancy random variable, this can either take a value of zero and one itself, and so can this measurement Z. Therefore, there's only four cases, right? So we can literally like explore all cases of this conditional probability. The probability that you measure uh, occupied cell con um, conditioned upon the fact that you thought the cell is also occupied. So this is what is being called as a true occupied measurement because your measurement is consistent with your uh, 
belief in this case, right? And here is an example of a false free measurement where you say that the measurement says that the cell is actually free, but your previous knowledge of or your prior scan would have reported that uh, the cell may have been occupied. And that's the probability of this happening. And you can similarly expand the cases when the MXY or the measurement variable is zero. Okay, so when we put this together with the uh, with this recursive Bayesian part, um, what you see is the following. What you see is we are going to be given a map or an occupancy grid. Remember that our occupancy grid is nothing but every cell has an associated probability of free or occupied. And we begin with this prior map. We measure some data from our robot, mostly in form of range sensor uh, values or reported distances to obstacles. We have a probability associated with observing a zero or a one conditioned upon the state of the cell itself. And then we use this measurement model to update our knowledge of the occupancy of the grid solve. So what we are interested in is computing the posterior map. Posterior map will combine the information from your prior and from your likelihood. Okay, so what we want to compute is the probability of cells being occupied or free conditioned upon what the measurement has reported. And so this is where Bayes rule comes into play. We can <coughs> And so this is where Bayes rule comes into play. Uh, we can decompose this posterior probability of associated with every cell as a product of the likelihood or the measurement model multiplied by the prior divided by the evidence. So this is literally the equation of Bayes rule, right? So uh, the probability of A conditioned upon B is the probability of B conditioned upon A into probability of B divided by probability of A. It turns out that working in these probabilities can become a little bit confusing and also mathematically inconvenient and complicated, unnecessarily complicated. There's a simpler way to look at this updating of the map, right? So the, the intuition behind updating is we think or we, we, we begin with some prior knowledge of what the world looks like. And as more measurements come in, we are updating that knowledge or the probability of what the world looks like from the point of view of the, uh, of the LIDAR. And so let me introduce a concept for simplifying this uh, recursive stuff, but instead of dealing in probabilities, we will be dealing uh, in odds. So the odds of something is defined as the ratio of something happening divided by the probability that something does not happen, okay? So the odds of X happening divided by the odds, the odds of X are defined as the probability of X happening divided by the probability of X not happening. And so this is a ratio and it's more convenient uh, to think of occupancy grid mapping when we use this notion of odds. So for example, the odds that the a particular cell is occupied given the measurement Z is going to be the probability that this cell is occupied given Z divided by the probability that the cell is not occupied given Z. That's consistent with this definition. And so what we can do is we can define this odds of the cell being occupied as this ratio, which is just from the previous slide, but we know that this numerator of this equation, we can expand using Bayes rule, right? So the probability of a cell being occupied given Z is equal to the probability or the likelihood that you see Z given the cell is occupied, multiplied by the probability that the cell is occupied divided by the probability of Z. So we are applying the Bayes rule to the numerator. And in fact, if you, you can do the same by applying the Bayes rule to the denominator and what will happen is that this evidence term which is the total probability of z which is actually actually hard to compute is going to uh, be eliminated 
And so what you will be left with is that, um, you know, the, the odds are simply given by this equation. So the odds of a cell being occupied given an observation or a measurement Z is going to be given by this product. And then we use this very commonly used uh, algebraic trick where uh, if you take the log of the left and the right hand side, then the log of the odds, since this is a product term, is going to be given as the sum of two different odds themselves. Okay. And I'll let you ponder at this equation for some time to convince yourself that all the uh, arithmetic and algebra is consistent. But what you end up getting is the following criteria that the updated log of the odds of each cell is equal to the previous or the prior log odds plus the log odd of the measurement or the likelihood of the measurement. So as you can see, this is much more straightforward and simplified. If we think of the, not in terms of the raw probabilities of occupancy of every cell, but we think in terms of the log of the odds of the cell being occupied or free, which at the end of the day denote the same thing, but in a different sort of metric. So we have an updated picture of our recursive grid mapping, occupancy grid mapping, we are given a prior map in terms of the log odds for every cell. What we observe, we can convert into a log odd of the measurement using a measurement model, which is the likelihood of getting a, a free or a occupied signal from your sensor data given the prior. And using that, we can get the posterior log odd update by simply using this equation. It's a summation of log odds. So that simplifies our update step of this recursive occupancy grid mapping or this Bayesian step. Right, so, so the thing to keep in mind is we are applying this update to only those cells for which we have observed something. Okay, so if I observe some measurement here and I observe all these other cells between the measurement and the robot to be free, I can then apply this equation to update the log odds for just these cells which are colored. And we are you know, using the notation that uh, to denote free cells, we um, make it more darker and to denote um, uh, occupied cells, we make it brighter. So this is the measurement model in the log odd form. Once again, um, remember the log odd was just uh, the sum, the updated log odd is a sum of the prior log odd plus the measurement model log odd. So this is the measurement model term of that equation. Uh, and what we are showing here is the probability, there are two possible cases, right? So um, the measurement model in log odd form is the probability of observing Z, uh, uh, probability of observing a particular value of Z given the prior belief was one divided by that not being the case. Okay, so the log is probability of X divided by probability of X complement. So this is correct in the correct format. Uh, and so what we have is since Z can take two values, we have two possible uh, cases. One is the case when your measurement um, is for cells with Z equal to one. Um, and another is the case for uh, cells with Z equal to zero. Okay, so uh, we have, basically we have two different types of uh, um, measurement models in log odd form. We have the log odd occupancy, occupied measurement model in which Z is equal to one. And then we will have the log odd free um, model, measurement model in which Z is equal to zero. Okay, so this is the uh, sort of a true obstacle being detected or true occupancy being detected to uh, divided by that not being the case and a true free cell being detected divided by that not being the case. So let's actually take a look at an example to make sure we understand all these concepts. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's an example. Um, we are given the log odds for the occupied and the free cell based on the previous slide, the equations in the previous slide. And these values are 0.9 uh, and 0.7. Uh, 
okay? And then initially our robot is somewhere here. And actually we will talk later about, you know, where the robot is located. We have a grid cell in which all the log odds are set to zero for all the X, Y's, which is equivalent to saying that the probability of something being, a cell being occupied and free is equally likely, which is equal to 0.5. Okay, so this is our sort of initial map where in another simpler terms, we haven't explored much. We haven't had any measurements come so far. Uh, and so we initialize everything to this gray scale, uh, which denotes that every cell is equally likely at this point to be occupied or free. Uh, and when some information comes in, uh, this is the log odd of the measurement model based on what the LIDAR uh, sort of reports. So time passes and what you see is the robot sends this uh, red ray and it reports a measurement that this yellow cell is occupied. So Z is equal to one for this cell uh, and Z is equal to zero for all the cells between the robot and this occupied cell. And so what you can do is use the log odd values of the measurement model and the prior to obtain this updated occupancy grid where we are using a special update rule that for, for wherever the measurement model says that we have a uh, occupied grid cell, we update the measurement by saying the new log odds for the cells with Z equal to one is the prior, which was zero, plus this value of 0.9 or the log odds of the occupied case. Whereas for the cells which were free or where Z was zero, we actually update the new value of the log odd for those cells by the prior minus the log odd for the free case. Why negative? It's just for visualization, right? We want, um, we want occupied cells to appear brighter, so they have higher values, and we want free cells to appear darker, so that's why they have uh, you know, lower values, or we negate the value. And so this would be my updated map, which is consistent with what I know about the world because I've only had one measurement so far. So from time zero, we had a measurement and we updated our belief of what the world looks like in terms of log odd of occupancies. Okay, and you can keep doing this from time T1 to T2. Maybe the robot turns a little, it reports another cell over here, uh, and I can use this as the prior now. So the new, so the output of the previous step becomes my prior for the next step. I hope that was obvious. Uh, and so if we take our prior from T1, we merge that with the measurement model, the log odds of the measurement model. Uh, and then, you know, you can see for some overlapping free cells, uh, especially the ones which are close to the robot, um, the new value becomes even darker. So we have more confidence or more belief that these cells are actually free in our grid model. And you can also see that for the cells where we have no measurements yet, uh, their belief is still zero. There's equally equal likelihood of whether they are occupied or not occupied. So that's what occupancy grid mapping basically is, right? You have cells which have random variables, but instead of dealing with raw probabilities of these random variables, we convert everything into this log odd format. And so we have a map where every cell has a log odd value. Uh, we have a measurement model, which is also, uh, can be also expressed in terms of the log odd um, style. And after you get the measurement, you update the uh, values of the log odds of every cell in this occupancy grid map using the measurement model. And you can keep uh, repeating that and obtain a better picture of what you, you think, you as in the robot, thinks is the status of every grid cell in this occupancy map. Notice, by the way, so far, we haven't said much about where is the robot itself in this grid map or what is the relationship between the grid and the position of the robot? That's part one. And part two is I have kept the problem very simple by only talking about a single ray, LIDAR model, um, whereas in reality, a LIDAR has many, many rays, right? So you will have much, much more data coming in rather than just a single measurement. 
So let's quickly go over both of them. The first case is, uh, let's actually think of how do you do this, um, how do you implement this recursive occupancy grid mapping um, in a global map frame? So here, just as an example, we've shown uh, occupancy grid or a global map, and this is the origin of the grid. It doesn't have to be in the top left corner, but uh, just for consistency, you have kept it there. And let's say, you know, we are not even dealing with three axes. Let's just say we are dealing with a coordinate frame with X1, X2. I can place a different coordinate frame on the base link of the robot. Uh, and then let's assume that we get a measurement along the primary X1 direction, uh, D distance away from the base link uh, of the robot. Okay, so, so uh, hopefully after the transformation and coordinate frame lecture, all of this was clear. So I'm not going to uh, re-explain what these terms mean. But we are given the occupancy grid map, we are given the robot. Um, to it actually first helps to think of your map in as a continuous space rather than this grid which is discretized right so maybe at any given time we uh, we know the pose of the robot which means we know its position plus its attitude so we know uh, x1 x2 is where the robot was and it was uh, its heading was theta degrees uh, along the x1 um, uh, measured from the x1 axis and so we can then use this information by saying that the reported occupied cell is a distance D away. Well, we're not talking about cells yet. We can figure out the coordinates of the point which is D distance away from where the robot is and express this point in the global frame of reference. Okay, so let me go over this a uh, little bit slower. The robot has reported something D distance ahead of it in its own local coordinate frame, right? The one which is shown here, uh, centered on the base link of the robot. And what we are suggesting is using ROS transformations that we've covered previously, you can convert this reported point into the global frame by using this rigid body transformation that we have covered in a lot of detail uh, in one of the previous lectures, right? So this is that rotation matrix in 2D, uh, and then there's a translation by this D distance. So you can obtain, I hope everybody's convinced, we can obtain the coordinates of X1 occupied and X2 occupied in this global frame. The question is, how does this map to this occupancy grid depiction of the world, okay? And the idea is actually very straightforward. So, you know, our occupied um, coordinates are somewhere here, X1, X2 occupied. We want to convert them into uh, occupancy of certain cells in a discretized map. So any map requires a parameter R, which is the resolution of this grid map. The smaller the R, the higher the fine grained is your grid. Uh, and goes, uh, goes without saying the wider R is, the more coarse grained your, uh, your map is going to be. And so here we have a very simple mapping that uh, I'm going to show you an example in 1D. Let's say the continuous point lies somewhere between 20 and 30, the value of the continuous measurement of the occupied point. And my resolution is 10 centimeters, so I simply divide my continuous range in increments of 10. I look at where the value of X is. It's in this range between 20 and 30. So I will index it into the third cell in my discrete space. Okay, so very small, sort of a straightforward point, but uh, I hope the picture clarifies what I meant by going from this continuous to discrete space. Uh, we are simply going to see what range it falls in. Uh, and we are count, keeping track of the number of ranges as indexes of this discrete cell. Remember, in a discrete space, um, you count things in increments or some, you know, in, in a counter rather than in a continuous scale. Um, the same can be done for another, uh, you know, size of the, uh, the grid size or the resolution of the grid size is uh, smaller in this case. Um, and it the continuous value happens to fall in the second interval. So we would say the second cell is occupied. In general, for any resolution R, uh, we can simply look at the index of the cell, which is going to be occupied by using this mathematical relationship as the ceiling of X divided by R. 
Um, another general case is that this continuous space doesn't always has to start from zero. So if it doesn't start from zero, but some other value, we can have an updated generalized equation to figure out the index of any continuous point in the discrete space, okay? So this was a quick detour to just convince you of that. Going back to the task at hand, we were able to calculate the coordinates of X1 occupied and X2 occupied in the, the, the global frame of reference uh, shown here centered on the top left. Now we just convert both X1 and X2 into their respective indices on the X1 and the X2 direction. And that will give us which of the cell corresponds to this occupied hit that we obtained in our discrete space. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one mapping using this relationship. Uh, I is equal to the ceiling of X by R. Um, and so everything, when we put it together, we get the following picture. We have a robot. It reported something a distance D away from it. The robot itself is located in a global frame. And so there's a you know, transformation between the origins of these two that we've covered previously. So anything that the robot uh, measures, um, we can represent in the global frame by using this equation, by transforming the local data into this global, uh, global frame. But we are not dealing with continuous frames, so we actually convert the X1 and X2 uh, points into the representative uh, indices of the cells along each dimension of our coordinate frame using this relationship, which is the same as before. It depends on the resolution of the grid size. And so this will give you which cell is the actual cell corresponding to where you will do the log update. Remember, the log update step is still the same. All we have done is instead of just always sitting on the robot and thinking of the map as it is viewed from the robot's perspective, we are looking at the global frame because the map has to be viewed in the global frame. Also, I have made an assumption here that I know where the robot is, which actually is the answer to the localization part of SLAM. Um, and let's just continue with that assumption because we want to understand mapping and then I'll address the localization part. Okay, so while it is clear that we can get the occupied cell, it might not be clear on how we assign the free cells, right? Because this is a straight ray of a LIDAR and it goes through many, many different cells. So should we look at the extent to which it goes through a cell or you know, should we count every cell it goes through? And there are different models in fact. Uh, what is shown here is the Brezel, uh, Brezenham's line algorithm, which Simply put is an algorithm which takes in two inputs and computes an approximation of a line in a discrete um, uh, sort of a environment. Okay, so it will give you a discrete approximation of a line in continuous space. So this is how we can utilize the measurement log model and the prior and be able to fill in the posterior update in our global map provided we knew already where the robot was and the pose as well. And so now let's talk about the case, which is a generalization of all what we've been discussing. And that is the fact that our robot actually doesn't have a single LIDAR measurement at any given time. It has thousands or many, many more measurements that it reports. In fact, the true model of the robot is something like this, right? It has a bunch of different arrays uh, at some fixed increment or at different uh, angles from alpha one to alpha five. And then each of them are reporting different distances. But the good news is that, our, and this is the reason now you will appreciate even more why we changed everything to uh, log odds instead of raw probabilities is because it just scales very, very linearly, right? So if we have multiple measurements, well, we will have multiple additions for different cells corresponding to every measurement, right? So we can, all you have to really do is, uh, instead of figuring out the coordinate of the X1, X2, just based on the pose of the robot alone, which was theta degrees from X1, uh, we will have to account for this uh, uh, alpha uh, angle of the LIDAR scan as well. As you can see, it's being correctly accounted for 
in our um, rigid body transformation to figure out the values of the x1 and uh, x2 coordinates corresponding to each of these uh, uh, continuous points. And then we will convert them into the discretized format and apply our, our measurement uh, log uh, odd update. And you can also use the same algorithm to approximate all of these lines instead of a single line. If there are overlaps, that will give you more belief in terms of what is free and what is occupied. Okay, so, so that was a overview of the occupancy grid mapping. Let me now show very quickly how all of this is used. Um, and so let me give you some examples. So here is an example of a static scan. And this is what, you know, the this is the measurement of the LIDAR. So each of these, um, there's no cells being shown, but you can imagine that, um, you know, corresponding to every point cloud of the LIDAR, there is a, um, a sort of a log uh, of the uh, uh, measurement model of the uh, cell being occupied. Uh, and corresponding to all this free region, uh, there could be a measurement model of the log of the odds of the cell being free. Uh, and so you can look look at the same data and convert it into this occupancy grid mapping perspective where anything in black, so this actually has flipped the, the convention of what the previous uh, part of the lecture was using, but everything which is dark and black is occupied. Everything which is this white or gray uh, or a shade of gray is free. And then everything which is this sort of a green hue um, we, is unexplored. Okay, we don't know that yet. Or unexplored is another way of saying that the cells in this part have equal likelihood of being occupied or free. So very quickly, let me address the part about the localizations. Right? So all of this discussion about updates and mapping and the, uh, figuring out which cells are occupied, they were sort of assuming we knew where the robot was in the world. And the reason I didn't pay much heed to that assumption was we've already covered a lot in detail how you can use subsequent scan information to estimate your own pose, right? So for this was this entire uh, sequence of lectures on scan matching that we've covered. And the idea was that given two subsequent scans, you look for the highest correlation between these two scans, and that will give you the best guess of what your updated pose is in the environment. And so this could be one reason that would give you, this could be one way of obtaining the uh, position and the pose of the robot in the global frame and then doing the mapping update step on top of it. Okay, so let's take a look at some, some more examples. This is actually a video. Um, so I think I've shown this video, shown you this video before, but it helps to, uh, you know, view the same thing again, but different information and different perspectives. So here you see what raw LiDAR scans look like uh, in the base link or the base frame axis of the robot. So the, you know, the robot doesn't move anywhere and more and more data comes in. Here is the same data being replayed uh, when we have um, in, the, in the sort of the map frame axis, right? So we are now seeing actually in the frame of the, or the coordinate system of the map, the robot's coordinate frame or the base frame is actually moving about and about. And uh, we can trace its position uh, using scan matching. Uh, and then the next step is, since the robot is moving with respect to the global frame, can we actually use uh, the occupancy grid ideas to uh, convert these measurements into a map of the world? And that's what you will see next. It's the same data. And this time we are using the measurements to update the value of the different cells of this occupancy grid map with either occupied or free. Okay, so this is how mapping works in, um, for the F110 car using a 2D type scanner, uh, LiDAR uh, type sensor. Um, there's a whole different ball game when it comes to vision-based mapping, uh, which we will touch upon uh, in a later lecture. Here are examples of the effect of resolution on map representation. So going from left to right, you see the resolution is decreasing, which means you have more smaller grid cells. 
which means that you have more fine-grained information about the presence of obstacles, right? So uh, you can compare and contrast the images on the left and the right in particular with sort of four times, um, you know, uh, difference in the, a factor of four of a difference in the grid cell. In ROS, there is something called the uh, map server. It's a package that allows you to save these kind of maps. Uh, it publishes the occupancy grid map over the map topic. Uh, you can save these maps, you can load these maps, and we'll go over this when we release the lab session of uh, uh, Hector Slam mapping in the F110 racing simulator. Now you should know what this uh, TF tree is also trying to show. It's This is the same TF tree that the car uses. Uh, so we have the map to ODOM, the ODOM to base frame and base frame to the LiDAR uh, transformation. Some of them are static transformations, some are dynamic. And so what you see here is that um, the Hector uh, odometry or the localization, the scan matching part of this package called Hector mapping, it provides you the transformation between ODOM and base frame, but you are required to provide the transformation between the LiDAR frame in which, or the measurement frame and the base frame or the base link of the car. So I hope that's also clear. You know, uh, if, if this static transformation was missing, uh, then we would incorrectly be mapping everything, assuming that the car is centered on the sensor itself, which is not the case. And then there are many, many more parameters which you can adjust for one very popular uh, SLAM algorithm called Hector SLAM, which uses exactly this odometry idea uh, of occupancy grid mapping that we've discussed. Uh, so we know what resolution is, um, map update distance and angle thresholds. These are thresholds which govern how often the log update happens. Right, so it could occur even, you could even have a threshold on time if you want uh, for periodic updates, but oftentimes it's enough to say, well, if my robot has moved beyond a certain distance or beyond a certain angular orientation, it's time to update uh, the log probabilities of the occupancy map. Sorry, the log odds, I keep saying log probabilities. Um, the update factor is a function or it's another way to represent this uh, measurement model log odds, right? So that's what the Hector SLAM package calls it. Okay, so let's take a look at another uh, popular um, SLAM algorithm called Google Cartographer. We'll take a look at it, uh, not in too much detail, but I do want you to be aware of this uh, uh, very recent and effective uh, package. So, so let me begin by first saying that the Cartographer was actually not released by uh, by the division of Google or Alphabet, call it what, whatever, um, which is working on self-driving cars. It might be, it's, it's using, um, uh, it's using uh, this package quite a lot, but uh, this actually was made by Google uh, way before they were working on self-driving cars um, to support their efforts uh, with the Google Maps, especially with the sort of the 3D uh, renderings and, you know, figuring out uh, how these, wide road networks stitched with each other. Um, so, you know, obviously this, that's not a manual task at the scale at which they were running things. So, so that's why it came out of necessity and Google uh, make a, made this SLAM package. Um, so the thing which is different about this particular cartographer algorithm um, as it, you know, sort of compares to this uh, very basic understanding that we have of occupancy grid mapping is its effectiveness and novelty when it comes to one part of SLAM, which I haven't uh, uh, spent uh, uh, any time at all yet. And that is the problem of loop closure, right? So loop closure is a very, very important part of SLAM. And I'm going to first explain what loop closure is, show you some examples. Uh, but just to set up, you know, the this uh, last part of this uh, video, um, Google Cartographer's algorithm uh, is very, very novel because it reduces this computational requirement of the uh, of how good it is and how fast it can do and how robustly it can do loop closure in maps. So what is loop closure, right? So the idea in loop closure is, so you can imagine that the robot or the F110 car, and we saw this in the beginning of the lecture as well, it's moving uh, in its environment or in the racetrack, uh, you are updating the status of the occupancy grid cells 
using the measurements which are coming from the LIDAR and you have this 2D map of the world. Um, but we know that there are errors, right? So there's uncertainty in the pose of the robot. So scan matching is not near perfect, especially if the environment is uh, homogeneous and doesn't have rich features for you to overlap and match. Uh, and so, so, so what can happen is the map you are building will start drifting without you realizing it from the real world. And the way to fix that is very straightforward, but quite interesting. If you revisit a place in the map that you had visited before, then you can, that's the opportunity for you to correct all of your previous errors. So this is what essentially loop closure means that there are regions in the map, if they are found to be the same, can we overlap them and use that in order to get rid of the uncertainty in our localization and hence uncertainty in our mapping altogether. So this is a classic, classic problem in SLAM and, and, and overlapping these regions in map uh, is not easy. And so different approaches for loop closure exist and cartographer was able to um, uh, use a particular way of solving this problem with least squares and the series solver that you will see in a bit uh, in order to close the loop very, very robustly. Okay, so let's take a look at this video. Um, I'll let it play a few times for you to catch what's going on. So we have this robot and you can see as the robot revisits right here is the first instance when it revisits a point it has visited before. And you can see when that happens, there's a slight correction. I mean, it's, it's naive to think of the correction as how much the map adjusts itself, but that's the visual aspect of it. And then you can see it happens again for the second time here as the robot goes back to sort of where it started, there's a correction and how the edges become so sharp because you see all these fuzziness or a lot of gray area uh, where we are not yet fully decided whether this is free or occupied. So that's because there is uncertainty in the localization of the robot using scan matching. And loop closure is the ability to correct that uncertainty and close this loop uh, by, map, by matching regions of this map with the parts of the map that you have seen before, okay? So here's a very detailed view of the cartographer's uh, uh, implementation. Uh, we're going to break it down and I'm going to go over each of them in, uh, uh, in not full, full detail, but I'll give you a good enough idea for you to be comfortable in trying to implement cartographer, right? So, so it can use as input many different types of sensors, um, LIDAR or range sensors. It needs an odometry source or IMU. And basically it needs some way to figure out its localization problem, right? So if you only give it a LIDAR, then it will use laser scanning to figure out where it is. Uh, if you give it some odometry or IMU data as well, then it can you know, fuse that data with the uh, uncertainty of the laser scanner to provide you a better sort of view of where it thinks the F110 car is. So we already know that on the real F110 car, we both have a range sensor and an odometry sensor. And we have both of these uh, topics also available in the simulator. Um, then, on the front end of this uh, algorithm, there's two separate systems, right? There's a local SLAM and then there's a global SLAM. And there's actually quite straightforward than what this uh, sort of picture um, might be uh, a bit imita uh, intimidating for you. So the, the, the task of this local SLAM is simply to generate very small pieces of the bigger map, which are called submaps, right? So Local SLAM is good to generate submaps. Um, and then the global SLAM is tasked with loop closure. It has to tie the submaps together and also figure out when there is loop closure. So you can see how this concept of submaps very naturally would lend itself to loop closure. Because instead of just comparing every scan to the history of the entire map, you want to compare submaps or these puzzle pieces with a history of submaps. Which, so you're basically simplifying the comp complexity of the problem. Okay, so, so very quickly, the, the front end or the submap, um, the way the cartographer defines a submap is in terms of how much data 
uh, from the rain sensor or how much data uh, you have seen or received uh, in a given uh, sort of amount, right? So it has some, some parameters or thresholds where once it has seen a certain amount of data, then it will stitch together all that data and create a local small map uh, uh, which is which is basically based on the localization within that particular uh, uh, small data set itself. Uh, now, uh, this point, which is the second point, is uh, perhaps a little bit important to go over. That what is the size of the submap, or you know, how much data is good enough? How do you decide all these things? Well, they actually have to do with the resolution of the occupancy grid, right? So, so. If your localization error is more than the size of your grid, then you've already covered more ground than what a submap should look like. So submaps are small enough so that the drift of the localization or the uncertainty of the localization due to scan matching or odometry is less than the resolution uh, of the occupancy grid. So you can see here how we, I'm actually showing you what possible submaps may look like um, in terms of you know, and, and you, you can see, you know, they're, they're not defined in terms of the number of occupancy grid cells because uh, here the robot may be traveling much faster. So it covers more ground in the same amount of time, for instance. Um, but the amount of data governs the size of the submap. Okay, so submap have their own sort of a occupancy grid update step and a whole collection of these range measurements. Uh, and so, um, you localize yourself within this submap, and then you, uh, you know, once you hit the threshold of the amount of data, a new submap begins, and then the global um, SLAM is tying or stitching these submaps together. Okay. So we have seen this uh, representation. It's the exact same representation as the occupancy grid map. So I'm going to go over this in, um, you know, at a higher speed because we've already covered this at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, but the probability grid is the same as an occupancy grid map. Uh, every cell is a fixed size. It contains the odds of being obstructed or free. We now know what that means. Um, this is the exact same 2D example that uh, I showed you earlier for a robot with a single array. And essentially, this is telling you that your new, uh, you know, the value of the random variable is the ceiling of the uh, point which has been reported by the LIDAR based on the odds of the measurement model and the prior. So I'm not going to go over all of the text on this slide, but these three steps are exactly the same steps that we covered in a lot of detail in the beginning of the lecture. And now all what is happening differently is and rather than being applied to the global map, this is only being applied to this concept of a submap, which is quite clever. Right, so so with that in mind, you can see different submaps are going to be generated. This animation doesn't show the boundaries of one submap to the other, but what I meant to show was that the global SLAM is going to tie these submaps and stitch them together and also solve this loop closure problem. Okay, so, so cartographer, just like Hector SLAM, also uses scan matching to figure out where the robot is at any given time. And this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, scan matching, we spend so much time on studying iterative point cloud, iterative closest point uh, algorithms and correspondence between subsequent scans, because that primitive concept um, is useful for both localization and based on that, you can also do mapping, right? So, so you can build these submaps and figure out where you are in a submap using uh, essentially scan matching. Um, and now, you know, I'm going over this at a pretty fast pace because I want to get to the, you know, the, the take home message that the reason why cartographer is so good is because uh, it actually uh, uses a very efficient series solver um, and, and solves a nonlinear least square effort, um, which is a variant of the scan matching problem. So we have studied uh, some scan matching variants uh, in the previous lectures. Uh, in particular, we spent a lot of time studying uh, ICP algorithms, um, but there's also something called correlative ma matching and cartographer uses a very clever solver uh, 
to efficiently solve the scan correlation problem. So if you have forgotten about this, uh, you know, uh, this is just one slide to remind you of the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, remember that we have the problem that you have a previous scan and a new scan, and you have to find some sort of a correspondence between these two scans in order for scan matching to work. And this is animation is trying to convey that same point. And then there are different metrics, different ways of solving this problem and iterative closest point matching uh, was one uh, algorithm that we discussed in detail. Um, Correlation-based scan matching um, solves some limitation of ICP. These are numerical limitations. Uh, in particular, you can get stuck in some local minima, and you know you have, at the end of the day, you will have poor estimates of your localization, or because uh, this, the, the ability for you, uh, your ability of correlating subsequent scans directly determines how uncertain you are about your own position in the world. Uh, and so correlation-based methods uh, basically formulate this problem as a nonlinear least square problem. And uh, uh, I'll point you towards the paper which has all the details in case you are more interested in learning more about you know, how this has uh, transformed the ability to do SLAM uh, on GPUs at very, very, um, uh, you know, fast rates, but essentially a uh, cartographer uses the series uh, solver uh, to solve this correlation problem. Uh, for those interested, and uh, you know, this is directly taken out of their documentation, uh, essentially what you are seeing is you have the scan, which is H of K, you transform it into the map frame. So we already know how to do that. Uh, this function is basically a way um, to do the uh, to to convert this information into this measurement model or the log odd model in terms of basically you know we are looking at the scan information in this map frame or the local sub map frame um, and converting that into and, and have this function to convert this information into probabilities or log odds um, and we are trying to minimize the sum of the square error uh, between occupied cells and what our probability is for all the points on the scan. So you can see this is a nonlinear problem and uh, the solution of this problem will give you the best estimate of the pose, which is the argument of this optimization. And that's what the series solver can return. Okay, so this was the submap. What the, the global SLAM does is, um, it has actually two goals. One is it is stitching together these submaps, but it is also solving the loop closure question, which is, is my current scan or my current submap or my current scan, do I ha have I seen it before in, an, in any of my submaps? Or is this submap looking a lot like one submap that I've already seen? Okay, so, so now uh, we have a pair of submaps I, we have like a submap I and we have a scan J at any given time. And this relative pose or this relative correlation describes, um, you know, where in the submap was the scan matched. So in other words, there's a hierarchy of scan matching happening here. So at the first level, you have your regular scan matching, which is to build each of these submaps. So you do your scan matching to localize there's uncertainty, but using this clever algorithm, uh, we can minimize the uncertainty and we can stitch the map together. Another sort of matching is occurring between scans and, and, and previous submaps, or between submaps and previous submaps. And wherever you know, uh, loop closure uh, occurs, basically if you revisit the same point that you did before in a loop, then there's an opportunity for the global SLAM uh, part of cartographer to close the loop or do loop closure by matching scans with previous submaps, not previous scans, previous submaps, or matching entire submaps with previous submaps as well, right? So what is shown here is, um, you know, this submap, why does it say that this would be a good candidate? Well, for one, this is a pretty unique part of this loop which doesn't look like any other part of the loop. So if you start here, as is shown here, you start with this purple trajectory 
and you go all the way around building these submaps, and then you revisit this part and your scans start to look a lot like your initial scans, that's an opportunity for the cartographer to minimize your entire loop uncertainty and uh, make this correction to the SLAM occupancy grid uh, in a single step. Okay, and once again, I'm showing you uh, what this loop closure looks like, but instead of using the raw scan values and trying to transform and correlate that with occupancy versus non-occupancy, we are basically using relative pose between a submap and a scan. So this term right here changes drastically than what is uh, in the paper. Uh, and then there's a bunch of different math that I will not go to because that's beyond the scope of this particular introductory slam lecture. Um, but you know, there's a residual term and there's a special loss function called the Huber loss function uh, which is also introduced and I'll let you, you know, read more if you are interested in learning about details, uh, mathematical details about the, the global slam part of cartographer, right? This is the loss function uh, which cartographer uses for the global slam optimization. So to put everything together, simultaneous localization and mapping is very, very essential for mobile ground robots such as the F-110 autonomous race car. Today we have seen what an occupancy 2D uh, map is. What do we mean by occupancy? It's a random variable. We've seen the concept of using log odds and the Bayesian filtering to update our probability of every cell of the occupancy map being occupied or free. And the way this update works is using a measurement model, which is the likelihood of observing um, what your LIDAR or the range sensor reports given your prior. And you combine that, you update your occupancy in this uh, um, iterative manner. Uh, you can control many, many different parts of it using uh, resolution settings and other parameters. And then we finally uh, had an introductory look at what is uh, Hector SLAM and Google Cartographer uh, as examples of two algorithms that can do SLAM. So this is it for the introduction to SLAM. I will stop here and we will continue our discussion in uh, advanced plot planning for the F110 base card in subsequent lectures. I hope everybody is doing well. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.